Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction and for inviting me. It was a great pleasure to be here and actually to meet for me for the first time many of the people whose papers I was reading a lot in the last years on vehicle routing. And yeah, maybe also thank you to Bill Cook and Kelt Helska, my co-authors here, who, when this uh, challenge started, eventually asked me what, whether I would like to participate. So I was looking into that before very shortly with two colleagues in Bonn. And we said, no, this is machine learning. We cannot contribute to that. That's, we don't know too much about that. But then after Bill and Kelt jumped in, I thought maybe it's worth uh, trying. And uh, so yeah, it worked out well. And maybe one reason why they asked me, besides from me being able still to write some good quality uh, standard C code, which was the basis of uh, our core algorithms, is that I also work or participate to um, this um, research at our institute with a, a company green plan that uh, was originally uh, founded within DHL, but then became a independent startup and was now acquired by a larger one. And we focus on time-dependent travel time. So Bonn is one of the areas in Germany or Europe that is suffering from traffic jams the most. And so this is really a big problem to us. And uh, also a lot of people in industry see that like that. And so we could gain some industrial partners here. And yeah, I just want to point out that we recently published some benchmarks because we will, they will, or we, we didn't find good benchmarks on this problem. We try to make them very realistic, so similar to the benchmarks that we see in practice using OpenStreetMaps and Uber speed profiles. So comparably realistic data. And if you're interested in this problem, take a look there. And now I come back to the competition. Yeah, what was Amazon's motivation? We already heard a little bit of it. So they said, well, the drivers know how to find good routes. And we should somehow gain information from them. So the objective was to uh, leverage AI, machine learning, what do we have, deep learning, computer vision, other approaches to outperform traditional optimization and operations research methods. Um, which somehow sounds a little bit like a threat, uh, at least to me, because I'm one of these more traditional guys. Though, I mean, uh, in general, I'm open to everything that works good in practice or also in theory. But um, uh, what was our motivation? I mean, in the area of chip design where I'm in, there are now about 80 to 90% of the papers employ machine learning, yet in the tools, it's maybe 5% machine learning or even less. So it doesn't play a big role. And of a lot of these papers just overlook the state of the art uh, for algorithms. And that was one the, the one motivation maybe to also show what the state of the art might achieve here. We were actually not necessarily expecting that we could win the challenge because it was focused on machine learning, but still give some good results. Yeah, that was our motivation. I mean, of course, we expected to do some machine learning, but none of us is an expert there, I think, at least for me. But I also think for my co-authors, none of us ever work with neural networks or reinforcement learning uh, in practice. Then, of course, this competition had a worldwide uh, it, uh, it, attraction and attention also uh, due to the high price money. And maybe eventually, the prices itself were also kind of encouraging to participate here. Uh, but honestly, I think for all of us, this was to a lesser extent. Um, yeah, what were these challenges or instances about? It was about the asymmetric traveling salesman problem. So the distances or speed, uh, driving times are given by, uh, by a distance matrix. Um, we have seen a lot of things, these things already before. So it was just ATSP, no weak routing, no partitioning aspect here. Uh, there were time windows, but we can just ignore them. I think uh, Amazon also ignored them to a large extent. Uh, but a lot of addresses per, per tour. So, um, um, 
And then, I mean, not for a TSP, but if this would have been vehicle routing, this is already uh, big instances. Um, there were geo coordinates, which we use for visualization. One could probably try to do something else with them, but it's not so clear what. Then there were 17 depots from five cities, and there was this route score, but again, maybe also as a disadvantage for machine learning, this were just three values, high, medium, low, so no uh, numeric uh, score for these routes. So here, some dispatcher at Amazon scored the route, well, this was a good route by the driver. And then there were these zone IDs that you have already seen before, and then uh, we will see that they will become very important. Uh, so how did the challenge work? So there was a model building phase where you should learn from 6,000 driven routes um, within a time limit of 12 hours. And then you should apply your model to 3,000 new instances with a time limit of four hours, but you also had 16 cores um, that you could use. And uh, yeah, we have already seen the similarity score, which was the basis for the final scoring, and the lower, the better. Um, this is an example of the tours, all the training tours in LA. And I mean, 6,000 tours sounds a lot at first. And the first thing when Bill approached me was visualize tours and get an impression. And this looked OK. But when I look deeper into it, uh, you see what uh, already was mentioned before, that the tours are relatively sparse when it comes to cover the area. So here's only one tour, another tour. Here might be two to three tours. But they're also quite different. And it's, yeah. When I saw this, I thought, well, OK, machine learning might, might have problems here. And so uh, that was, for me, one, one motivation really to participate here. OK. Um, so we can solve ATSP problems using Concord. And this is an example of a driver tour on the right-hand side and the optimum ATSP tour. So you see there are crossings, but it's due to the asymmetric uh, uh, cost. And the score for this example here is 0.063, but it's roughly 10% shorter than the actual driven route. So yeah, ATSP is probably not the best solution, though we have seen in the last talk that it's already uh, yeah, also not so easy to beat with machine learning alone. And then we started to, uh, and we also observed these zone IDs and we tried, started to make a sense of them and we actually watched YouTube videos to learn uh, how Amazon drivers deliver their uh, parcels. So this is a picture of an Amazon car. So they have these big bags. And each bag corresponds to zone ID. So the reason is they open a bag, and then they deliver all the parcels in that bag. Uh, and then they uh, put the bag away and open the next bag. So they have, in fact, a clustered traveling salesman solution. And OK, you can solve that. Uh, yeah, this is an example of a driver tour and the um, zones here. These are just IDs that we gave, but uh, they are colored by the same zones. Or the, these are the stop IDs, and they are colored by the zone. So you can solve clustered ATSP problems. You can still solve that optimally using Concord. And you get already a better score for this instance. The length increased quite a bit. It was 124,000 and something before. Um, but you still see that it's quite different. So this. The driver first went south and then all the, delivered all the way north while the optimum tour uh, started in the north. So this is uh, the, the way from the depot. So we are starting in the north and then we are stopping somewhere at this spot. And from here, we don't care how the driver goes back. So we didn't uh, draw an arc here. So yeah, the, the zone order seems to be quite important. And actually, this is also from YouTube. You see that the drivers get from, from, from Amazon uh, their bags, and then they get their uh, the zones and a, a sorting of the zones as part of the input. They also probably have uh, an order for the actual stops. Um, but yeah, if you can somehow learn this zone order, that should bring you forward. 
And this is where our learning aspects come to, uh, comes into play. We try to learn from the uh, um, uh, from, from, from known tours, the zone order. But in many cases, actually in most cases, the drivers don't uh, preserve the zone order strictly. They might go from zone B to X to C, return to B because they forgot a parcel. There are also these oversized parcels that do not fit into a bag and then they notice, oh, I forgot a parcel. They go back to zone B and uh, that destroys this zone order here. It could look like this, for instance. So what we do, we apply Tarjan's algorithm to um, compute a topological order and strongly connected components. And for this example, we get these components um, because we have this cycle here, which puts all these elements into one component and a cycle here, which puts these into a component. And then we just extract um, constraints um, from this topological order. Namely, B should be delivered, if we have now new zones from a new tour, A, B, C, D, E, then we know that B should be delivered before E and C should be delivered before E and yeah, A um, and D, they didn't occur in this reference route. And we use always a reference route which has a maximum zone overlap um, to extract such constraints for our TSP. When you do that, for this example, we, are, we were lucky, we immediately went to the right starting point, so to the south, and the score improved, which is now already yeah, below what, or um, um, with, the, with the approach, you would probably have been second in the, in the contest. And then the driver goes north, but there are still some subtle differences. Um, there are further aspects which we have seen before, um, namely that uh, these texts, the, the, the zone are traversed in a certain order coming from these texts. Um, so we have these texts which consist of uh, uh, some, some um, uh, um, uh, gamma, x, y, delta. And when you go from zone to zone, typically only one of these uh, letters is changing, decremented or incremented. So for instance here, we uh, traverse these three from one, two, three. Only this Y part would uh, change, and mostly the Y part is changing. Um, so in addition to the zones, which you consider as a cluster, we define what uh, a super cluster as those zones where everything except the Y is identical. So for instance, um, for this first tour, we would have these four uh, super zones. And uh, yeah, we would try to first serve a super zone before we go to the next one also in our TSP tour. And then you can go further. There are super, super clusters where, where gamma and x is identical. So for this example, there are two super, super clusters. And there can be a top level cluster uh, where only the gamma is identical. And here we all, that doesn't occur too often, but here we have an example where um, the gamma changes and we have two top level clusters. So we have a hierarchy of clusters. And we always want to stay within one cluster um, within a hierarchy before moving to the next um, cluster in that hierarchy. Um, so that, that you can just formulate as, as constraints. But then there's also um, the transitions, for instance, from a, um, um, uh, from a, su a super cluster to, to the next super cluster where here this letter E is changing to D, um, that will always occur either in this example at a one or at a three, never at a two or I mean, uh, never at a middle element for, in a sequence. So within each super cluster, we sort the labels and we know either we go in the sorted order in the reverse order. We don't know which one, both occurs, we observe both. So that has to be left open. But we can pair these um, adjacent uh, 
zones uh, uh, to be um, um, served subsequently, leaving the order open. And then when we go to the next um, supercluster, uh, yeah, we don't know whether we end here with a one or two, and we don't know whether we start here with a one or three, so we might be in the situation that we add multiple choices, and we get these uh, disjunctive constraints. So we want that either this zone and this zone is neighboring for the transition between these two super uh, clusters, or these are neighboring, these are neighboring, or these are neighboring. So we don't know which one, but some of them have to be neighboring. And if you do that, the score is getting even better. And the superclusters are similarly um, performant as, as the precedence constraints were. The precedence constraints alone give a slightly better score than the superclusters alone, but together they give this score. Um, and yeah, when putting that onto a bladder test set, so during the competition, uh, from all the training routes we had, so the 6,000 routes, we took all the high score routes, which were considered of good quality, uh, as a basis, as, as uh, the basis for benchmarking. And we were always learning on the full set, but we made sure that when applying our learned constraints, you would never learn from the same route that we are applying it to. So we would also learn from all, when we uh, evaluate one of these routes, we would make sure that that particular route is not used to generate precedence constraints. And then, I mean, we start here with the driver tools, the ATSP tools on this test set give you such a score which is um, a bit worse than we have seen before. Um, the clustered ATSP tools are then around this 0.05, a little better. Um, Adding the precedence constraints gives us this score, which is yeah, in the range of the second place of the competition. So superclusters then, together with the precedence constraints, gave much better, much better score. And now we can also apply precedence constraints, learning precedence constraints for superclusters and super superclusters, which is finally improving this even further. And Bill always, or once we were below one, uh, 0.03 well, was always pushing us, we have to get below 0.02. That is our goal. And this then happened, uh, yeah, maybe a, f a few, few weeks before the deadline, but we still tried to get better then. But actually that goal that he set very early, um, yeah, we reached that eventually and we could not improve on that so much. Um, so how do we solve? these problems. I didn't mention that so far at all. I mean, we don't solve anything optimally here. Um, we solve, or we try to solve ATSP problems. So we are minimizing a length objective, but we penalize the length with Lagrangian multipliers. And how did we choose them? Well, we looked at solutions. We looked at situations that we wanted to prevent. We guess what price we have to set to prevent that, and that's it. Um, um, and so the precedence constraints were actually the first that we added, so we penalized them by 1,500. And as a comparison, I put, pick, put here a typical difference between the driver tool and the ATSP, which is in the range of 13,000. So 1,500 is well above what a typical improvement move in a local search would make up. So it's in a kind dominating such things. Um, then for here, we were not sure whether the learned constraints are really the, give you the, our, us the precedence that the driver eventually chose for the final tour. Uh, for the clusters, super clusters, super super clusters, we, and top level clusters, we were a bit more sure, so we put a very high weight here. That's mainly the reason for this. And um, yeah, one should note that this penalty can be evaluated in linear time. Um, algorithmically, um, yeah, we used the variant of LKH3. And um, yeah, Kelt Health counted a lot of improvements to that code uh, during the competition. Um, 
what that, that the algorithm actually do. So we uh, set a runtime limit for every instance, and as long as we had some more time, we started the following. We initialize a random tour, just throwing dices. And then uh, we uh, do some iterated local search, uh, where we start with a perturbation, or what, what Bill likes to call a kick. So we kick against the tour, and it disturbs a little bit. Uh, formally, it's a random walk, where in the first step, we try to get rid of some long of the long edges, but using some probabilistic method. And then we always uh, use a four opt kick to perturb the tour and avoid local uh, minima. And then we would do a fast local search, restricting to um, three opt moves and special uh, special three up moves and four up moves that preserve the order of the tours in each segment because we have the asymmetric TSP, we cannot flip the order easily. Uh, so that, that's the reason why we did not do any two opt and we also didn't do chained link kerning and things also, just these uh, things. And in order to speed up the local search, we also did not evaluate our actual objective at the end by which we would uh, compare the results of the different iterations here, but during the local search we would focus on the length and we would accept things if the length improves and the penalty um, uh, improves as a secondary objective. Because this can be evaluated quickly. I mean, in constant time while this takes then uh, for the best thing here, we then do this linear time evaluation of the penalty. Um, of course, our model is not perfect, so spending more and more running time at some point started to decrease the results slightly. So during the contest, we considered also other models. We tried actually several different things. Uh, one other thing uh, which we called alternative tours is that we use, instead of just the precedence constraints, uh, we use their transitive closure. So, for so instance, if we have the constraint B should be served before C, and C should be served before zone E. We also add the explicit constraint that B should be enforced before E, which would add to the penalization. It doesn't change the feasibility, but uh, increases the penalization, and maybe the algorithm behaves a bit different. That helps a little bit. Um, so our, our default setting, uh, using uh, these running times for the default and these for the alternate setting, uh, because the default, I mean, we spend more time in the default because it gives better results after all. But if the alternate, tr tr alternate tour is better by at least a factor 1.1 or shorter, I mean, we only compare the length here, then we would use the alternate tour and call that the merged result and that gave the best uh, result for us, and that is what we submitted to the competition, which we, yeah, luckily uh, could win. Um, this is the uh, leaderboard of the competition, and um, you see here the score, and um, uh, yeah, there was some gap to the second team. Um, actually, that, yeah, I, I was a bit surprised that there was such a Get because I mean our ideas were not like rocket science. It was looking at the, uh, tours and solutions and try to guess what's good. Um, and then at some point, yeah, the the, the 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 contestants were quite close, but they are all very close to just the cluster TSP, which many of them probably applied. Uh, another interesting point here is the model build phase. So the first six teams, they essentially did not do a lot of learning. We probably did among the most learning with our uh, strongly connected, connected component approach. Uh, then here with the uh, uh, seventh place, that's where the model build phase starts to get some running time and where people probably applied some, some machine learning in the competition. Uh, for the model apply phase, yeah, we took almost all the time but, I mean, the reason is that we didn't want to become second because we just didn't spend all the running time that was available. Yeah. Um, 
I come to that, um, yeah, I mean, there I could also, I mean, you see that we get also very good scores in very short times, and you could even reduce this further, um, which we actually did after the competition. So that is mostly thanks to Kel to figure out how to tune LKH further for these particular instances. So now we get the best or the similar or better results than with these running times using one second and one second for our approach and the alternate approach. So basically he eliminated a lot of data structures and algorithms that are actually targeted to solve large TSP instances, say millions of cities or billions of cities, which they uh, solve these days. And um, then, uh, um, we observe these running times and I mean the score uh, luckily is comparably stable. I mean it's getting a bit worse right now so maybe one should use only half a second. Um, I think we did experiments also going to up to, to a tenth of a second which would still give similar results. But yeah, on the score itself we could only improve marginally so that was no, no real improvement. But also, oops, no one else uh, could improve on the score. So I think the currently best published score uh, behind our approach is this 0.03. And yeah, we have just seen, I hope that I, I'm citing here the correct number. I was a bit uh, wondering in that paper which one would be the uh, correct one. This is what was just uh, presented before me. Um, and yeah, as conclusions, um, yeah, conventional or traditional methods are still important. Um, also, on the previous talk, there was a conclusion that uh, traditional algorithms are not flexible. I would say, well, this LKH is quite flexible because we could easily add a lot of difficult constraints here uh, using Lagrangian relaxation. So. Um, I, I, I would consider that flexible. Um, yeah, I mean, what did we do? I mean, we did essentially a partial uh, reverse engineering of the Amazon processes, presumably, uh, which was then at the end more uh, effective than machine learning. But the point here is, as uh, the previous uh, presenters have uh, explained already, that probably the plan tools should have been part of the input. I mean. He, I mean, you're a driver, you're getting a list of 200 destinations. You're not starting to puzzle around a better tour. I mean, you're going and you start delivering them. And only if you see, oh, no, I can't go there, that road is closed, I go there first, then you might deviate from that. But uh, I think it's, it's not really the case that the drivers have too much tech, tested knowledge. Also, from what I experienced uh, in our industry, application that drivers are often very happy to get a good um, a tour plan. I mean, today the drivers do not necessarily know the area so well. Uh, it's not the best paid job uh, and uh, maybe if they are using Amazon Flex, they're not do, using, doing that on a daily basis. So uh, they just do what they get um, in many cases. and. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm not sure whether this is really the right approach or was the right question. I, I'm sure that you can employ machine learning to generate constraints for the deliver, uh, daily tour planning. So I mean, to learn which, close, uh, which uh, roads are currently closed. Uh, I mean, Google is not always very good in that. So in Bonn there was a uh, major public road, so actually a federal road for the city which was closed for more than a year and uh, I think during all the time Google would still send you through that road. Um, and these are of course things if you can learn such data somehow and use that for, for to optimization that can be very beneficial. Um, yeah, if you want to try to improve the results, I would be eager to see improvements or if you have good ideas, maybe also collaborate. So the source code is available, uh, uh, source code is available here. Uh, there's also a paper uh, that will appear in transportation science and uh, essentially 
all the contents is already available in the archive. And finally, there's Bill's website, who tells our whole story very nicely with videos and, and uh, uh, animations and a lot of pictures, if you're interested in that. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Um, I mean, for these instance sizes, LKH, uh, if it's only the ATSP, LKH will in most cases find the optimum solution for you. Uh, with the um, uh, constraints, it's not so clear, uh, but we don't have tried to compute optimum solutions with the penalties because then we, we cannot model that as a, a TSP problem and pass it to Concord so easily any longer. Um, but I would assume that we are, that LKH will be optimum in many cases because the tours are so short. But yeah, I mean, it might be, um, um, or let's put it this way, it was not so important for the competition to get the real optimum tours because the model was not perfect neither. So that was not our focus. Uh, but uh, for most solutions, we didn't have panels, uh, penalties in the final solution. So we would find uh, feasible solutions with respect to our model. to what experience drives do goes against everything that uh, so we should understand what right drivers can do and cannot do and try to optimize using any method machine learning or whatever and uh, instead of reverse engineering uh, what they're doing so what but uh, congratulations to you to all the groups that uh, did well in this competition so I don't know. <laughs> you know there, there might be. I mean, I think. I, I, I think. Now, I think the point is that there might be road constructions which, should, which the drivers know and then avoid. And you want to learn these things somehow. Or maybe, maybe they know that, okay, that guy is never there at that time of the day. I try to go there later to deliver, deliver my parcel. Yes, but perhaps you are learning that some driver has a girlfriend in some place. Yeah, <laughs> maybe he has a favorite uh, place to get a coffee or something. <laughs> yes. Just to amplify that, uh, this is a, a personal story, one data point. Uh, I looked at my Amazon account, but it's going to be the, the driver is five stops away. I ran down, I waited for the driver. I saw him go to that house, to that house, I'm right here. He drives past me. In a way. <laughs> <laughs> he goes to the next house. Okay. He then turns, he doesn't back up, but he pulls in the driveway, turns it around, comes in, pulls into my driveway, hands me the package, and I say, uh, and he says, Oh, I have to do it this way. That Amazon assigned me to do these house numbers uh, in house number order. Okay, I, I'm not so house numbers were a bit uh, skewed on the screen. You know, I have to that way. I think, well, well, they don't, no, I think that's, course, that's uh, not necessarily true. Because I have to take a picture of each package I deliver. Uh, and so the combination of having uh, this, this and all that. So uh, you might think that the driver is 
uh, omniscient and all that, but it could be artifactual. Though, yeah. What goes on? There's one artifact, just one story. But they, they are. I think they are in most cases changes. So in the app, they also can move stops around a little bit. So that's possible. But um, this happened a year ago. Probably they can only do that for good reason. So if they take too long and change the tour, then they are, might be in trouble. And that might be a reason why don't they just stick to the tour they were assigned to. I just want to comment on the last two comments that I, I take from my experience both with UPS and then prior to that with less than truckload. So, I mean, I, I think one of, one of the things we're seeing here is it's an artifact of the information that Amazon's giving out, the way it structures the bags, it does the zones. And, and when I was working in LTL in Detroit in the early 2000s, this is exactly what we experienced as well, in that one of the companies I was working for thought that their drivers were stealing time, they were going to visit their girlfriend or <laughs> going to their favorite donut shop or whatever. It turns out, like in LTL, you at the time particularly, these were palletized loads. So what goes in first comes off last, and they simply didn't optimize the order of loading. And so they basically put the driver in a situation where they, unless they knew they could get somebody at one of the docks to rearrange the pallets, there was nothing they could do. So they had to go in the order. And sometimes those orders were just absolutely terrible relative to the optimal, the optimal tour for that vehicle. And then in, in the extent that, that there is absolutely information we don't know, and it's not just road closures, it's like you said, you know, with, when, when I was working at UPS, again, in the early 2000s, I mean, one of the things we realized is that you know, you'd, you'd show up to a place and it was lunch and there was nobody to drop the package off with. And so the drivers obviously would learn that over time. And at least at that time, UPS was keeping drivers on particular zones for a relatively long period of time. And so they would just figure out, look, I'm not gonna go there at noon because I have no way to get in the door and drop that package off. So you would end up with routes that didn't look like good routes. They weren't optimal routes based on the information we had, particularly at that time. But you know, when you got that driver feedback, it was perfectly sensible what they were doing because there was essentially this time window that you didn't know yeah. about. And I think these things are really, really common and, and drivers, you know, they do figure that out and to, because they're trying to, you know, they want to get done and, and get home as well. So I, I think there are things we don't know, but here it really feels like there were artifacts to the way the operation was designed and that was really pushing the structure of, of the differences you saw from the optimal solutions here. Yeah. Maybe you just had I'm sorry that I cannot answer that question, but I do agree I think there are several reasons. And um, what we're looking at is that a promise is really taken seriously. Sometimes routes will change because someone has a promise of time different than other person the same route. And this is almost a mandatory. They have to do whatever they can to try to meet the, the, the promise. And that can change, for example, routes. They will look strange, but they still meet the promise. And I think there are other factors uh, that make some routes look a little bit strange. <laughs> yeah, but I still think that one should try to learn these additional constraints and put that into the tour planning at first and not just blindly apply machine learning to. Well, UPS has done that, you know, the, I don't know if anyone outside the US maybe not see this, but they for years have carried something they call a dyad. And, and when they first built this, they put a GPS unit in there. People thought they were crazy. But what it was able to do was help, you know, a lot of the road mapping sort of stopped right at the curbside. But what they found was there were a lot of places they would deliver to where you had driveways that might be a quarter of a mile long. And so that was adding a lot of time to that tour. And so, I mean, they don't sell it, but a lot of people think they probably have some of the best maps in the entire world, at least for, you know, that last mile delivery because they know things like this, right? And so that's, so So there are, I mean, and I'm sure Amazon's doing it, they can't tell us that, but um, it's probably why they're probably taking pictures of things because they get a geocode on there. But, um, you know, they. I, so I think they are, you know, a lot of these companies are trying to capture it. So, because they're, they're again, those are the things we don't know. So one, one of the reasons why Amazon uses this zone-based routing is that uh, usually what they do is that they sequence all the zones and then they split this, uh, and give like the first 
Okay, he's on us to driver one, then the next case wants to driver two, or close to case one. Uh, and because they want the driver on a daily basis to visit more or less the same neighborhood, because usually what contributes more to, to, the, to the time is not the driving, but the actual service time when he gets off. And, you know, he doesn't know what the code is, and then if he visits uh, a certain neighborhood every day, then he'll know the code and be able to do it faster. So let's thank again all the speakers.